Let's turn to Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. While you're getting there, I always would like, always want to say is what a privilege it is to be back here at Southern Seminary. It's such an honor. And Dr. Hall, thank you for your kind and gracious words. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about it later. But, um, but thank you for just the opportunity to be here. Thank you to our band. Thank you for Isaac uh, leading us out in worship. And thank you for the members of Highview Baptist Church who I, you know, put a plea out to come. And I thank you so much for coming and opportunity for us to worship. But let's dig into God's word. In the honor of God's word, if you are able and willing, I'd ask you to please stand in the honor. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us? Or for our adversaries. And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, Lord, we come before you. And Father, we just yearn to encounter you. Lord, to hear from you, to see you, to know you. Lord Jesus, we need you. Father, may you just speak to us so clearly. Lord, may we worship you so dearly. And Lord, may you do such a beautiful, mighty work here this morning. May our lives be changed by your goodness and your grace. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord, over my years of ministry, keeps bringing me back to the book of Joshua. There are so many incredible leadership lessons. There are so many ways the Lord speaks, the way the Lord defines himself so clearly. And it's such an encouragement to those of us who have been called in to his ministry. And so I want to take a look at this passage in more depth because it's a surprising one. In context, it really comes out of nowhere. If you know the book of Joshua, Joshua 1 begins with the call and the commission of Joshua where God clearly states that Moses, my servant, is dead. The greatest leader of the Old Testament has passed away. Now the Lord turns to Joshua and commissions him to now lead the people of God to take the promised land. And he tells him specifically that no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I've been with Moses, so I will be with you. And he commands them three times to be strong and courageous. And that great promise of the Lord, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous, to not be, do not fear or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua follows the command of the Lord and prepares the people. And in chapter two, we meet uh, the, the, Joshua sending out two spies secretly and we meet Rahab and we see that the Lord has already gone before them, that the Lord is already breaking down barriers, that the Lord is, his reputation, his testimony has gone before them. Chapter three, we see the strategic crossing of the Jordan and God opening up the waters of the Jordan, the Ark of the Covenant, going before them. God showing clearly so many similar scenes to the Exodus account where the Lord is opening up the Jordan. They are crossing on dry land and God is giving a testimony and he commands them to take 12 stones from the Jordan, set them up so that when their children ask in chapter four of what these stones mean, they are to give a clear testimony of who the Lord is, what he has done for them, and and for them to follow the Lord together faithfully. In chapter five, the Lord sets apart the people of God. He circumcises them because the generation that has risen up have not been circumcised, the sign of the covenant, and then the institution of the Passover. God preparing his people. God does not rush into battle because all of this is happening in the shadow of Jericho. He slows down because there are more important things for him to deal with First, victory in a place is not his primary concern. Victory in his people is. 
And John Piper wrote, God does not call us to be somebody. He calls us to know someone. And the Lord is bringing his people close and preparing them. And they are on the verge of Jericho. And our passage comes at such an unusual moment because it becomes very personal to Joshua. Dig with me to the passage. Take a look back with me. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. There comes a defining moment for every follower of Christ, where the Lord clarifies his power and command and calls for our allegiance. James Montgomery Boyce writes concerning this passage, he writes this, why didn't he reply, the command of the Lord, yours, I am for you in Israel instead Although we know he was for Joshua and undoubtedly did assist in the battle against Jericho, the commander replied with a negative, neither, no. He said, that is, I am neither for you nor for your enemies. I am here to command the Lord's armies. The point of the exchange seems to be that it was not for Joshua to claim the allegiance of God for his cause, however right it was, but rather for God to claim Joshua. Another writer, David Jackman, says this, he has come not to take sides, but to take charge. Does he have our allegiance? Because he's calling for it. He has shown up at the most critical of moments in Joshua's life, and he's clarifying who is in command. This is the Lord's kingdom. It's his church. We belong to him. We are here to follow his lead. But what's amazing about this passage is when you begin to dig in, the command of the Lord, our Lord is revealing himself, and it's so encouraging. I mean, I come back to this passage, and the Lord brings me back over and over again, showing me new things about him. I mean, let's dig in for just a moment. Who is this commander of the Lord? When we first meet him, it says that, behold, a man was standing before him. Most scholars believe that this was a a pre-Christ incarnate moment, that the Lord is making himself known, showing up physically. What's amazing here, he's making himself known, and he's accessible to us. He's showing up in such a way where we can know him, understand him. That's why when Peter writes, he says, man, we are able to know him. We're able to fall in love with him, that we can have a relationship. That's what's amazing, that God calls us into a relationship with him. And he's making himself known, and he's showing up and fulfilling the promise that he gave Joshua in chapter 1. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I have been with Moses, I will be with you. That promise of, I will be with you wherever you go. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He's fulfilling a promise here, making himself known. And he's showing up at the most perfect time. According to scripture, according to Psalm 46, 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. His timing is perfect, but he's also perfectly equipped. Take a look in the scripture. A man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. Not only is his timing perfect, but he's perfectly equipped. What did Joshua need? He needed a commander. He needed a warrior. And here comes our Lord, perfectly equipped. He's not showing up with a tennis racket and a smoothie, wondering what's going on. He's showing up, he's not aloof. He knows exactly what's happening. And he shows up not only in perfect timing, but perfectly equipped. No matter what you are going through, no matter what struggle, what trouble, what is standing in front of you, the Lord Jesus is more than adequate. And he is powerful. 
and he shows up in our lives when we need him the most, and he's perfectly equipped, and he is showing up not only perfectly equipped, but he's showing up in action. That sword is not sheathed. That sword is drawn. He is showing up ready to take command. Our Lord is active. The scripture is clear. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to come to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He has come and he's in action and he's ready to take command. He is in command. Look at that title. He says, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he says, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. He is in full authority. David Jackman also writes, Joshua went to look at his problem and found himself meeting God. Jesus said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even winds and water and they obey him? Our Lord is in full authority. There's nothing that surprises him. There's nothing that catches him off guard. There's nothing that he cannot overcome. And here he enters into Joshua's great need because Joshua is standing at the verge of Jericho. And Joshua's an older man. He knows what it's like to lead. He knows what it's like to command. He knows what it's like to enter into battle. And he is standing on the verge of Jericho. And what is he going to do? How is he going to overcome this fortified city? And here comes our Lord in full command, in full authority. And what I love is he doesn't come alone. He comes as the army of, with the army of the Lord. He doesn't come with just a army. He comes with the army. And he's come to lead out for us. Man, takes us back to some other moments where the Lord's army shows up. Remember back to 2 Kings chapter 6, when that servant of the Lord, he says, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots were all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Our Lord has come to take command. He is in action. But what we love about this passage, his identity is so clear because he is God in the flesh. Because the moment he announces and gives his title, what is Joshua's reaction? He falls to his face and worships. And he says, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. He, our Lord is holy. And he is perfect and he is divine and he is all powerful and he has come to rescue and to redeem and to lead us. And that is a word that we all need to know. He is real and he is present. Pointing back in this moment, you know Joshua had to have a moment where he is hearing these words from, his, from our Lord and he's going automatically back to a moment that Moses had at the burning bush. You know Joshua heard that story. You know he walked with, with Moses. You know Moses probably told him multiple times what happened at that burning bush. And hearing those very words, take off your sandals, for the ground where you're standing is holy. And the Lord's leading him to a keen moment to be able to do what? To communicate to him his plans. Our Lord is coming to Joshua with a clarity about what he expects. Now the question is for us, is what do we do with this? What is our reaction or what should be our reaction? Here Joshua clearly lays out for us, our first reaction should be one of worship. Look at the scriptures, come back with me verse number 14. And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord, now I've come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped. And said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? We are here to worship our Lord, to be in a position of humility, to fall before him and say, Lord, what do you have to say to your servant? 
This is the position that we must be in as followers of Christ. We must be in a position of worship, in a position of humility, to say, Lord Jesus, it's all about you. We are here to lift up your name. We are here to glorify you. May we follow your lead. It's not about our preferences. It's not about our ways. It's about your ways. And here Joshua falls down before the Lord and says, Lord, what do you have to say to your servant? In light of his goodness and grace, it's amazing how the things of this world all of a sudden fall dim. And we are able to say, Lord Jesus, your will be done. What do you have to say to me? How can I follow your lead? How can I know you? How can I make you No, we are called first and foremost to give our allegiance, not ask for it. We are called upon to be in a position of worship and we are to ask for instructions and we are to receive his vision, his revelation. Biblical vision is never created, it is received. We are a people who are under command not who are leading out in our own power, in our own strength. We are following the lead of the Lord and his alone. And here's the question, are we here to follow him in whatever he says? Are we ready to be obedient? Because you know the plans were laid out for Jericho. And you know the moment Joshua received them, you had to know, it had to go through his mind. How in the world are my commanders about to receive these instructions? This is crazy. This doesn't make any sense. But the issue of Jericho and the issue for us in this world is one of faith. What did Hebrews say about this? The walls of Jericho fell because of what? Because of faith that we are called upon to believe. We are called upon to trust. We are called upon to obey. When the Lord enters in and into our toughest, our most difficult moments, we are called upon to follow his lead and to give a testimony, a testimony of his goodness and his grace. Over the past several months, I've heard some of the greatest testimonies I've ever heard in our church. People standing up before the people of God and giving a testimony of who Jesus is and what he has done. And it has been life-changing for me to hear young men stand up and say, man, I used to look in the mirror and literally see the devil and the Lord has entered in and I'm no longer that same man. I'm now a child of the King and I walk out in the freedom of Christ. That's life change. That's a testimony of his goodness and his grace. That's what he's calling us to walk into. We're called to walk into a moment where his name is lifted up and glorified. And that only happens when we follow his lead and when we demonstrate the faith that he calls us into. Here's the best news about this passage. This commander of the Lord has shown up in his fullness and his glory in Jesus. And he's put himself on full display so that we are able all to know his presence and his power. The Lord Jesus has come for us and he stands before us and we are called upon to worship and we are called upon to ask, Lord, what do you have to say to your servant? Listen from Colossians. Listen, Jesus is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's a position of power, that's a title. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Paul goes on and he says, and you who once were alienated alienated, and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, 
stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Jesus has come, and he stands before us, calling for our allegiance. He has come not to take sides. He has come to take charge. And he is leading out his people. And we as a people are to worship. We are to bow before him. And we are to say, as Joshua said, what do you have to say to your servant? And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, you are so good and you have come and you have commissioned your people to know you and to make you known. Father, may we be the people that you've called us to be. This morning, I don't know where you're standing. I don't know what trouble, what hindrance stands before you. But our Lord is with you. He is a very present help and he is perfectly present and he's perfectly equipped. And we can know him. We can experience his grace and his power. Lord Jesus, may we be great worshipers of you. May we fall in love with you. May we be fully obedient to you. May you do a mighty work in and through us. And Lord Jesus, may we fulfill your commission to go to go and to make disciples and to experience the promise of your presence that you are with us always, even to the end of the age. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.